that's it. You mentioned that I was going to get to actually mindfulness and meditation. Like I've been meditating for oh, my, I took a year and a half off when I finished working with Contiki before I got my residency in Australia. I did this year and a half in travel and I was meditating an hour and a half every day at that point. I really got into it. And yeah. then the deep dive study into all these esoteric fields to understand them more. But wh when did you discover both mindfulness and meditation? When did you discover both? Yeah. Or what practices have you adopted? I mean, obviously, like, growing, both. growing up, my dad used to have all these gadgets. It's so funny. It makes me laugh. He, um, <laughs> he'd walk into mum and dad's room. He'd be like in the afternoon or something because my dad's been meditating for decades. Yeah. And my dad would be, you know, those like old Oakley sort of sunglasses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd have it on in his in his bed meditating or on the lounge or something. And they'd be lighting up the there's like a like, dad, what are you doing? And my poor dad, you know, he's obviously trying to um, have some self-care and downtime. And with five children, I don't know if that's possible. And when he started doing a mantra meditation, my brother would stand at the door and go, he found, my brother found out his mantra. <laughs> I don't know how. But when dad was meditating, he would stand at the door and <laughs> repeat the mantra over and over. So I don't know how relaxing that was. But to answer your question, I was grown up, I, I was brought up in that environment. Okay, that was something that my dad did. And then my mum studied counselling and um, other integrative therapies. So our house was almost like a Jungian therapy oh. <laughs> dinner table. Uh, so I've always been interested in that kind of side of things, you know, human potential, flourishing, therapy, anything you can do to optimise how your mind works yeah. and I like to think of myself as um as being almost like an athlete but in the mind yes I don't know if, I don't know if there's a word for that um, uh, I, I love it and I, anything I can do to hone my brain I will try yeah and so my dad's making a little bit more sense with the glasses I don't do the glasses with the with the thing oh, although there is study to show that that light and sound can stimulate certain brain waves. So that's where he was coming from. But. Where come from? I wonder how close any of you came to having the middle name Om. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think Mum would have vetoed that. Um, but I so yeah, so I got really into it. I think the PhD as well was sort of an exercise in a lot of isolation and research. So I um, I saw a coach throughout my PhD. And at the time, there's a bit of a stigma around that. I remember people saying, why do you need therapy? Like, what's wrong with you? you know, it was almost like this abnormal psychology model that if you go and get help for any kind of behavioural stuff, then you must have a problem. Whereas now we know that coaching for anyone is a great idea, whether you're a mother or a surgeon or a banker, any kind of high performance coaching is only going to do good things for you. So throughout my PhD, because I had a lot of time and a lot of freedom of time, so I could do, I could spend my day however I could structure it however I wanted that's when I got into meditation a lot because I could have an afternoon meditation every day and you just notice I mean anyone who who practices it regularly you just notice how good you feel after now because I've got children I do it as I'm going off to sleep at night because that's the only time I can guarantee that I won't be interrupted and it's the same it's the only time I can guarantee that the same thing will happen every single day yeah. I can't do it in the morning. I can't do it throughout the day. But at night, going off to sleep, I, I do a practice called focusing. Nice. Which is, which is actually about, like, I do mine, but I don't have the wife, the family, the kids, all that stuff. So I find morning meditations. And the reason I've learned over the years, you, you know, you don't need to do an hour meditation, 15 minutes or something in a morning. And in a morning is easier for people that are maybe not used to it because you're coming out of rest. Yes. Your brain is already kind of somewhat stilled. You've, you've had a pause button on the noise from yesterday. Yeah. So it's actually easier to get into that silent yeah. space in the morning as well. That's the only thing I would say to that. But ultimately, it's finding a, a way that it works with the lifestyle that you have. And exactly. finding it, well, I think it's... Exactly. It's oh, doing it. You know, I also love an afternoon meditation. I mean, it's, you know, it's yeah. just great. I just, I love to meditate. But I think um, it's, it's one of those things that you need to remind yourself to do even. it's like a, it's like a someone with a um, mental illness going off their meds because they feel so happy you know like no no that's why you were happy that's right. how I'm right. meditation. i don't need to meditate anymore because i'm so i'm feeling so great no you're feeling so great because you were doing all those things yeah keep doing them Here, yeah. here's what i often joke right add value i often joke that this is my third book my first was ignite your potential my second i did it on stage and the book's called overthinking overthinking kills everything the end that's the book right so that's it it's done i don't need to go to print 
It's an audio book only, right? It would be ironic well, to go to prison. And I know this is a subject you talked to a, a bit again. What, what do you find to be some of those underpinning reasons? I know what my take of that, but what, what do you think are some of these underpinning reasons and causes that make people overthink stuff that actually prevents them moving forward or making those decisions or being connected? What well, do you I think, find that I think to be? a lot of overthinking is often linked to anxiety. So people who are just general, you just set up as a warrior, you know, someone who thinks of all the consequences and what could go wrong and what could happen. So this is probably a personality type linked to overthinking and a bit, and it's also called catastrophizing. Um, but in terms of the underpinning causes, I think it's so complex, you know, it's got to do with our genes. It's got to do with our early environment. It's got to do with who we are as people. I think I, I, so I started overthinking I, my first, recollection of consciously overthinking was in kindergarten and they said I went to a Catholic school and they said we're going to say a prayer for all the people in year 12 who are doing the HSC today and here I am <laughs> what's the HSC and they said oh it's a big exam where you get tested on everything you've ever learned at school <laughs> that was the wrong answer <laughs> That was the wrong answer to give someone like me. So yeah, I got into overdrive, trying to remember what color I colored the fish, the, the, you know, the thing that we had to stuff and then we had to do staples. And I, the poor, I feel like going back to me at that point and go, it's all right. Yeah. It's not everything. You yeah. don't have to remember every yeah. single thing you ever learned at school. It's October of, year, of kindy. You don't have to remember what you did in January. And I immediately went to that. So I don't know in terms, you can't sort of say, oh, that person will be an overthinker because you can get oh, No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's yeah. I love how you say overthinking, catastrophizing. catastrophizing. Yes. Um, meditation is catharticizing then. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that kind of 